If you compare the DNA of every human being on the planet, you'll learn that we are 99.99% the same. So why do we spend 99% of our time focusing on that 0.01% that separates us? I'm Michael Koenigs and this is More in Common, a show where I travel the country looking for stories about what brings us together. Kids divided by the border wall unite across a tennis net. These two cities, even though they're in different countries, I think they feel like one place. Yeah, we feel like one community, although we get separated. An artist whose work celebrates and captures the humanity of the homeless. The way he sees me, the way God sees me, the way he painted it, Brian gave us the homeless a voice. A mother who offers unconditional love to gay couples when their own family steps away. I don't have to have my blood DNA mom, but I still can have a mom. It turns out this country has countless stories of unity. But to find these extraordinary friendships, we have to reach out. This is More in Common. This is a show about accepting our differences and embracing our shared humanity. So we went to Little Rock, Arkansas for a story about overcoming old biases in the name of unconditional love. So this is our marriage license we picked up on October 13th. That says we're wives. Oh, that, that we're wives. That's my wife. So. <laughs> so how did the two of you meet? I happened to see a Instagram post. You like that post? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, she should go to dinner with me one day. I mean, I was about a heart, a heart attack. I was freaking out. Last second, right before she walked through the door, I like hurried and grabbed the menu and like put it up to my face and acted <laughs> like I didn't see her walk in. She says, hey, and I look up and I go, oh, hey. <laughs> we immediately felt like best friends. So for me, I was just having so much fun. But Tabitha's mother refused to attend her wedding. Your mom, is she coming to the wedding or it was? Mom hasn't said anything. So Tabitha reached out to an organization called Free Mom Hugs. To not be accepted by your family is just devastating. Everyone needs acceptance from their mother. If your mom won't attend your same-sex wedding, then call me, I'll be there. Tell me about your own family. When your own son came out to you, you initially weren't born. No, not at all. No, uh, we had raised our children in a very conservative church. Uh, when he turned 21, he said, Mom, I met someone, and I really need you to be okay about that. And that's the day that he faced his biggest fear. That's me. And that's the day that I had to face the reality that I have a gay son. Sarah was our officiant when we first got engaged. My family wasn't for sure coming. It turned into, will you be my stand-in mom because I won't have a mom there. With the struggles that we've had with her mom, Sarah is the type of person we want at the wedding. You're coming here for two women who are about to get married. Why are they important to you? They're important because they're, first of all, human beings. And I just couldn't imagine not being there and just hopefully making the day a little better for Tabitha. I'm freaking out. Yeah, everything's gonna be fine. Just imagine yourself when everything's said and done. Are you still feeling nervous? I'm excited. Marley, can you take Tabitha as your wedded wife? I do. You may kiss your wife. For me, the day is, is bittersweet because I know the journey that I took and the regret that I would have had had I not accepted my son. And I was able to see him confident, healthy, vibrant, visible, living authentically. And I've seen that in Tabitha as she has gone throughout this journey herself. I don't have to have my blood DNA mom, but I still can have a mom and acceptance. She's what everybody deserves to feel. Nogales, Arizona and Nogales, Mexico are neighboring cities spanning two countries. We traveled there to meet a group of kids crossing the border to play tennis over a net instead of a wall. Mary Lou, how much do you love tennis? Like this much. That much? Uh, as much as my arms can go. What's the difference between Nogales, Arizona and Nogales, Mexico? I feel like the poverty. In Nogales, Arizona, there's a lot of poverty, but in Nogales, Mexico, it's more noticeable. Although we live so close, one side is such a difference than the other side, and I feel pretty lucky to live on this side of the border. So you play tennis right over that wall. Yeah. We feel like one community, although we get separated. What do you think it would be like if it weren't there? I don't really know. It's kind of sad because we get separated, but it's good because it's protecting us. Do you think the sport brings people closer together? Yeah, I would say it does. Because of tennis, I've gotten to meet new people, make new friends, 
gotten to cross the border more often. It helps us to meet as if that wall, that border wasn't there. We just crossed the border into Mexico. Are you looking forward to playing some tennis over here? All right, let's do it. Mary Lou plays tennis as part of the Border Youth Tennis Exchange, a nonprofit that teaches tennis to kids on both sides of the border. Today we're really excited to have our two groups together, our American students and our Mexican students. How much do you love tennis? Es mi deporte favorito. Lo mejor es que somos de diferentes países y cada una tiene sus cualidades. How do you feel about the border? Pues me siento dividida de mi familia que vive allá porque ellos no pueden cruzar y algunos son migrantes. Mi mamá desde que era bebé me, me ha sacado la visa y siempre he podido cruzar yo. When you're a local, it doesn't matter what country you are, you just go back and forth. You have family in the other side or have friends. People don't know this kind of dynamic we have. People have this thinking that everything across the border is completely different, but tennis is tennis. They're the same points, same rules, same nets, same rackets. These days in the media and politics, everybody gets kind of inundated by one narrative. And people talk about undocumented immigration, they talk about drugs, and frankly, that is not the whole story. We're really trying to use tennis as a, as a new lens to look at border communities. Yo sentí que conocí a niños nuevos y también sentí que como que formaba un lazo con ellos. On the tennis court, we're separated with the net, but at the end of the tennis game, you have to greet the other person, you have to be nice. The border should be our tennis net and we should all come together, you know. Homelessness is on the rise in cities across America, even wealthy ones like Orange County, California. But this painter is using his art to make an impact on that growing epidemic. Night after night, and I hear these screams coming from outside my window, and kind of either ignored it or said, oh, there goes the screaming homeless man. But it was that guy who kind of got my attention. And two days later, I went out to meet him, and he starts telling me about his life and his story and his journey. And in that first conversation, something inside of me was just like, hey man, can I paint your portrait? I was seeing something in him that was beautiful, behind the ruggedness, the smell, all that stuff, you know? I saw to who he actually was. We have tight relationships with a couple clients, not all of them, but one lady in particular, her name's Kim. About 34 years I've been on the streets. At the age of 16, I was gang raped by two acquaintances. And back then you didn't talk about it, so I never came out with it. Um, instead, I went the other way. I started rebelling, started stealing, started into drugs, men, the whole nine yards. It was one bad decision after another. I remember actually running into her years ago before I met her and being like a little intimidated by her. I met Brian at one of the lowest points of my life. Brian showed up with Chinese food one day and it was awesome. What was it like to see yourself for the first time on that canvas? When he actually did it, it was just amazing. The way he sees me, the way God sees me, the way he painted it. I didn't think that I'd look like that. Brian gave us the homeless a voice. We're in Orange County, one of the wealthiest counties in the country, and yet there's a homelessness problem here. How is your painting addressing that? When paintings sell, and we use 50% of the proceeds to help the person in the painting. Some may ask for a bike or a hotel room or to visit family, whatever it may be, and we facilitate the availability to do that. So this is where you got the food for the first meal you two had together? This is the place. She loves Chinese food. <laughs> You were able to sell that painting to someone who's supporting your initiative, and what do you guys decide to do with that money? Brian took me shopping, I bought some personal items, and I bought my bike and trailer. Seven speed Schwinn Cruiser. Schwinn Cruiser, that is classic! <laughs> and actually going into a store and buying it and not have security follow me out was just, it was a different feeling. When I met Brian, I had a darkness in my eyes, I didn't see anything, and he just helped me bring it over to where I see differently now. Very unlikely friends, huh? Yes, very much so. Kim's daughter is now out of the foster care system and she needed some money to pay her rent. And right around the time she was shorting her rent, Kim's painting sold. So Kim took a few hundred dollars and asked me to write a check for her daughter's rent. It was a wonderful feeling. 
because all my kids is life. I chose drugs over them. I was there for them physically, but not emotionally. And to be there for her at that moment and just say, here, it felt great. This is why Faces of Santa Ana exists. It's way more than just the painting. It's to restore lives, restore families. And uh, we got to witness that, like, live and in the flesh. Brian's my lifeline, and I hold on to that. Because if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have the portrait. I wouldn't have any of it. I wouldn't be sitting here. You know, so I hang, try and hang on to that every day. <laughs> <laughs> when we come back, meet the gaming grandma who's inspiring teenagers all over the digital universe. Oh, you have over 400,000 subscribers. <laughs> it's ridiculous. They say I'm the Bob Ross of gaming. What does an 82-year-old grandmother have in common with millennials across the country? A lot more than you'd think. How'd you become the grandma gamer? My son gave me a computer and a game and started me in both, and I became addicted. I had a few subscribers and they asked me to record my gameplay. So one day I decided to do it. It took off from there. I told you not to step on that. You have over 400,000 subscribers. <laughs> what is it that you do that makes so many people want to see your gameplay? It's because I'm older and it's because I play different than most gamers. They say I'm the Bob Ross of gaming. What kind of comments are you getting when you're talking about your games? It's like, hi grandma and you're the grandma I never had or I wish my grandma was like you. Talk about your friendship with Joseph. He just would comment and talk to me on my channel. Then he made a video for me and sent it to me of him walking through his woods in New Hampshire and then turned around, faced his camera and said, this is Joseph. And that was the first time I even got to see him. Snowy mountains are rifting, Grandma. Hope you like it, Shirley. So Joseph, you got a friend who's 82 years old and playing video games? Yeah, <laughs> can you believe it? When my dad passed away, and then my grandmother, she passed away like a year almost to the day he did. I sort of got back into games for like stress relief and watching YouTube more. You'd never met Joseph in person? No, no. Our cameras were rolling when Shirley met Joseph for the first time. Boo! Ah! <laughs> oh my gosh! How are you? Hi! Look, this is what I got. Oh this my gosh. This is so exciting! I know! This is what I got for you. You just gotta sort of pry it open. Are you excited for Elder Scrolls? Six. Of course I am, and be... everybody's asked me that. I know. We have the same kind of level of creativity, like she likes to quilt, I like to make stuff. Obviously this gift is something that I made for her. Even though there's an age difference, we have a lot of things in common, and obviously lots in video games. Joseph, you were going through some tough times when you yeah. first discovered her channel and her gaming. You know, not think about, you know, the stress and anxiety that came along with the deaths in my family. Her content and her alone was something that I needed um, just to feel more comfortable. And, and that's what makes her personality so important to me, is that she actually cares. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> There's a toxic side to gaming in terms of the comments, the homophobia, you know, sexism. How do you deal and combat that? People are people to me, and that's all I care about. Gaming is an open world and it should be open to everybody and everybody should accept everybody into it. Well, the two of you are about the most uplifting gamers I've ever come across and <laughs> exemplify how you can come together. And I feel like I, I've uh, got to meet you, you know, I can just uh, reach out and say goodbye, you know? <laughs> when we come back, one student athlete's mission to wrestle with the boys. You wanted to compete against males. You wanted to be in the male league. Yeah, they wouldn't love you. How come? My birth certificate said, female. I just like the physicality of it. Something about like fighting somebody, like messing them up. You like that, you like that, the, the, the pain, the intensity of it. Yeah, I just kind of like fell in love with it. And you dominated in the girls tournaments. You were undefeated your junior year? Yeah, and then I was undefeated my senior year. Two seasons and not being, getting beat once? Yeah, I was pretty happy about that. Yeah, how can you not be? I would like wake up at five o'clock, I would go to the gym, like go into the sauna, go like run a mile. And then I would like work out during lunch and then I'd work out after my workouts like during school. 
You like put every ounce of like passion and dedication you can into the sport. It changes you as like a complete person. It's like insane. You wanted to compete against males. You wanted to be in the male league. Yeah, they wouldn't love you. How come? And my birth certificate said female. Everyone knew who I was. Like I never like was like not open about like talking to people. A lot of the girls were supportive, and like everyone around me was supportive. There was a lot of controversy though as well about you taking the mat. Why? I was taking testosterone. I put my testosterone shots like up on uh, my Instagram, and so. That was like, oh, you're beating all these girls because you're taking testosterone. So things kind of exploded after that. Yeah, it got like huge. A 17-year-old transgender boy in Texas has won the state's girls wrestling championship. Mac has been taking testosterone and it shows. Many people are upset that he's taking steroids, even if they're prescribed by a doctor. They feel like that gives him an unfair advantage. Like everybody just basically like disregarded like my work and dedication. I just felt like completely betrayed. The story about Mac is a big deal in, in the wrestling community. Mac was a two-time um, state champion in girls' division, but women's wrestling and men's wrestling is two completely different sports. Mac was being recruited for the women's team here. Mm -hmm. They offered a scholarship. Mac said, "No, I want to wrestle with the men." Mac called me, and you know, he obviously he was getting you know wrestling scholarship from from the women's coach. And I told him that you know to be part of the team, he has to you know do what a lot of guys do. They just have to walk on and prove themselves. He was just like, as long as you work hard and you dedicate yourself, I have no issue with you wrestling on the guys' team. I was like, bet. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen him on the mat yet because he's been injured and all that stuff because of his surgery. You know, here at Life University, we're all about inclusion. You know, Mac wants to be treated like, like a man and he's, you know, doing things to, to be where he needs to be. and. Uh, why not give somebody a chance? Why not let him wrestle men? You know, that's all he wants to do. And do you feel like you're an advocate for the trans community? I mean, yeah, I like to think so. Disregard the word trans. We're people. We are people. And we all have a choice. We all have a damn choice to make ourselves better every day. After like my story came out, there was like so many like trans individuals. They were like, I'm a trans athlete, like, I don't know what to do. Like, I was just like, holy crap. Like, there's more kids out here that haven't even, like, came out yet, like, as trans themselves, or, like, they're hiding from their coaches or they're hiding from their school. In order to, like, be okay with yourself, you have to love yourself first. You gotta, like, do what you can every single day to be the best possible person you can be versus what you were yesterday. Getting 1% better every single day. That's just in my nature, like, I like helping people. Inspiring them through your example. I, at least I hope so. Like that's why I want people to take from my story is that even when like people are like in your face, like you could still come out positive. You just have to have the mindset in order to make the best of it. When wrestlers around the country watch this, what do you want them to take away from what you guys are doing here? You know, everybody's fighting something. You know, the more you look around, everybody's fighting something different. And you know, the beauty about wrestling is that when you come to the man and you shake everybody's hand and you go out there, all that gets put away and just two guys going out and battling to see who's the toughest. You could have one leg, no legs, no arms, no limbs. Whatever race, however, if you're rich or poor, everybody can wrestle. That's the beauty, beautiful thing about it, you know? It's the great equalizer, these yeah. mats. Yep. But you might have to take a few bruises, huh? Oh, yeah, I'm not getting out there. Yeah, it's not a joke. Like, I've never been in this type of atmosphere before, and I'm super excited to get beat up on every single day. And if I know I'm not getting beat up on, then I'm probably not going as hard as I'm supposed to be. Are you intimidated at all? No. No, I want to be smacked on. I want to be hit on the head. If somebody smacks to the floor, I'll just get right back off, dust off my feet, and just go right back as hard as I can, as much as I can. So. When we get back, meet the Native American tribe that once called Manhattan their home. Columbus didn't discover America. How can you discover something that already had inhabitants? Long before the Dutch sailed up the Hudson River here, all of Manhattan belonged to the Lenape tribe of Native Americans, who returned for the first time in over 300 years for this powwow. Why is this powwow so important to the Lenape tribe? This is the land that we originally came from and it just turned into a big city and got really colonized so we were forced to relocate. These same moccasins of my ancestors were like dancing on this same soil and I think that's really remarkable. 
it's amazing. There's a lot of energy and every dancer is putting 100% into their dancing and everyone has so much pride in what they wear. And you're one of the top dancers out there, right? You're the lead. <laughs> it is my pleasure to introduce our head lady dancer, Vidoski. Stonefish. So give her a round of applause as she waves to the people here. I feel like throughout my whole household, we were always playing powwow music. I was born and raised on the Grand Traverse Band Indian Reservation in Peshawitan, Michigan. I've been dancing since I could walk, going to powwows since I was a baby. And now I go to Michigan State University and I study human biology. Now you're on this college campus yeah. and sometimes people are treating you differently. Initially they see my name <laughs> and they're like, what is that? They think that either I live in a teepee <laughs> or like that we're extinct or like we don't exist. They just assume that I'm a figure from the past, but it's 2018, I'm still here. All the schools I went to, I was the only Indian in the whole school, so like everybody would be looking at me all crazy, like I wasn't supposed to be there, like made me feel like I didn't belong there. I know I'm different, but they treat me like I was like an alien or something like that. How important was it to maintain your tribal traditions? To me, I feel like it's important just because powers create like lifelong friends, like and those friends turn into your brothers, and like just like where I feel the most comfortable is, and like where I feel like like I'm at home. You eventually met someone yeah. at this at one of these yeah. powers. Yes. What did you say to impress Vadaske when you first met her? I was definitely pretty nervous just because she's like really pretty and like. I thought I was pretty goofy and goofy looking, so I was just really nervous and like I just try to like make her laugh and just tell her little jokes and stuff like that. Just to see her smile just makes me feel happy. You guys are quite the pair, huh? <laughs> yeah, I feel like he's singing for me, so I dance for him, I guess. <laughs> pretty romantic. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> How do you feel about her? <laughs> I love her a lot. She's like my best friend. She makes me really happy. Since now I go to school, and it's so hard to see everybody that's different from you, it's just nice to see someone that's as passionate about everything that you're passionate about. And it just makes me proud seeing him sing and dance because that's what I love to do. Columbus didn't discover America. How can you discover something that already had inhabitants and already had people that had a life and a culture and had a system of living? It just doesn't let us tell our story on how we came to be. The United States was something before he came here. It's just no one gets to know about it. Every tribe has their own traditions and cultures, and a lot of them have their own language. But every tribe in North America shares one thing in common, and it's that they powwow. He's from all the way in Idaho, I'm from Michigan, but we connected through powwows. So I feel like everybody can resonate with our songs and dances. Every time we get visitors, you'll see them bobbing their head or tapping their toe to the beat. And I feel like all people just have a sense of music and dancing. These are just a few stories of Americans who, despite these polarizing times, have come together to prove we all have more in common. And there's a lot more where that came from. Follow us on Facebook for weekly episodes and more incredible stories. See, it went from hate to being able to accept people for who they are. You're encouraging a new generation to take up the mantle and take this guy. Absolutely. Woo!